says I will talk about surface osteosarcoma, that is a mistake. I have talked about talking about surface osteosarcoma, but osteosarcomas are so rare to start with that I decided that talking about a subgroup of osteosarcoma, like those of the renal surgery, is not maybe really very useful for the general surgery pathologist. So I decided that I would talk about what we need to know about joint disease. And that's maybe my lecture. There is normal cartilage towards the hip joint, and then there is another area of cartilage which is the epiphyseal plane. One has to remember the greater trochanter also is an epiphysis. And then the rest of the bone, the metaphysis, which is defined as an area maybe four centimeters between the epiphyseal plane and the, the shaft of the bone, should not contain any cartilage. And then you come towards the lower portion of the bone, and then there is another epiphyseal plate and onto the part. And this is the epiphysis. This area here will be called the metaphysis, and this will be diaphysis. This is just a close-up view of the, art, the, the cartilage, including the epiphyseal plate and the articular cartilage. And one thing one can recognize from these normal cartilage is that they are plate-like structures and they are not forming nodules. So if you see any kind of nodular proliferation in bone, that means it is abnormal. And this is the upper cartilage. There are two types of cartilage that we must recognize as being normal. This is the articular cartilage. And you can see that it is very hypocellular. All of the pink staining material is a matrix of the cartilage. And these darker staining areas are the nuclei in the cuneum. All cartilage cells occur in the cuneum, whether the neoplasm or normally. So this is the kind of cellularity one might expect in articular cartilage. This is a lower power appearance of the articular cartilage, the surface here, and cartilage, and then there is bone formation at the lower portion of it, because that is where bone is being formed. You can see normal articular surface. These nuclei are unremarkable. It is very difficult to see the nuclei under even medium power <coughs> normal cartilage. So if you start seeing nuclear structures, then one has to worry about it. And this is just a higher power of appearance of the articular cartilage. They tend to occur in clusters like these you see. And these are individual cells, and this is the lacuna, or a lacuna space. It does not matter how many cells that you see in one of these spaces. The importance in distinguishing benign cartilage from malignant cartilage is how many nuclei do you see in one individual cell? And in these, there are only Now, this is a low power appearance again of the article cartilage. They tend to have a columnar arrangement towards where bone is being formed. So this is kind of a normalization phenomenon. And this is just a higher power appearance of this columnar arrangement of the cartilage cell. This 
is typical of regenerative joint disease. And what do we see in that? First of all, you notice that there is no joint space. The joint space has been eradicated so that the bone of the tibia is in a position, the bone of the femur. In addition to that, there are these calcified nodules in the soft tissue. So these are two of the features that one recognizes in degenerative joint disease. That is, loss of articular cartilage with narrowing of the articular space and then these nodules. The third feature of degenerative joint disease is seen in this case. Notice here that this portion of the joint looks pretty normal. There is space between the fever and the tibia in this area. But if you look on the other side of the joint, you see this narrowing of the joint space. And in addition to that, there is a cyst-like space in the distal femur. So that's the third feature. Narrowing of space, osteocartilage in smooth bodies, and cystic spaces. And here's another example of a huge cyst involving the proximal tibia. Now it could very well be a neoplasm if one did not know that the patient has degenerative joint disease, which is not very pronounced. But this lesion here, which extends right from the articular cartilage almost into the diaphysis, is part of the degenerative system. This is an example of degenerative joint disease involved with hip joint. You can see that the fever is practically right next to the ilium, and there is no joint space between these two bones, and then there are these nodules of cartilage calcification in the soft tissue, and this is just a higher up here. Or up here. Now this is the kind of case where these little nodules of cartilage, these nodules of calcified bodies, which we recognize as calcification typical of cartilage, looks almost like a neoplasm or like synovial cartilage. This is an MRI of degenerative uh, joint disease showing the cyst-like space, thickening of the synovium, and multiple nodules of cartilage. Radiologists talk about T1 and T2 in uh, magnetic resonance images, and here is an example of a cyst which is bright on T2 and dark on T1, pretty typical of those patients. Now, when I was a medical when I was a first year resident, we, were, <coughs> we used to get specimens like this quite often in the uh, frozen section lab. Removed for degenerative joint disease. And what are the features that we see here? First of all, this is the articular cartilage. And as you come towards this, it looks kind of sick. And here, the articular cartilage is completely gone. So that's one of the features, loss of articular cartilage. And here again, looking on face on pepper head, loss of articular cartilage, remaining articular cartilage here, but loss of hormones like necrosis. And this specimen shows all the features, loss of articular cartilage, cyst-like spaces. And another example of degenerative joint disease with loss of articular cartilage.
in the uh, subarticular region, there are two possibilities. One would be a cyst of degenerative disease, joint disease, and the second one would be a synovial cyst. Synovial cysts are associated without, do not associate with degenerative joint disease. So that really is the only way to tell the difference between a cyst of degenerative joint disease and synovial cysts. And this is just a higher power of the particular cyst. In addition to cyst-like spaces and loss of article type, there are these nodules <coughs> which occur in association with degenerative joint disease. As you know, these figures are relatively commonly involved with degenerative joint disease. And this is what these nodules look like. You can see there is this flaring out of the bone around the joint space. And this is what it looks like under the bone. The lesion is really flaring out of the bone, almost like an osteochondroma. As you know, osteochondromas have a continuity between the marrow and the marrow of the uh, osteochondroma, and the cartilage cap will be continuous with the cartilage cap. But here, we know that this is not osteochondroma <coughs> because of the loss of artery. Here you can see thick artery, <coughs> and here it is completely gone. And these loose bodies, present as this, little calcific nodules of different sizes. Now here is an extreme example of degenerative joint disease with osteocarditis loose bodies. Now this patient was a young man, he was only about 29 years old, and he presented with swelling of the arm, as you see here, and this little huge swelling of the elbow joint. And when they opened up the elbow joint, these little nodules just rained out of the joint space onto the table. And everybody was convinced that this is synovial cartilage because the x-ray really did not show the <coughs> joint disease. But this is what it looked like on the low bar. Oh, and I'm showing you the low bar not because we can recognize the uh, features of it, but because I want to show that all of them look the same. And what do they look like? They look like this. It looks like a tree cut across, a tree bar where there are multiple layers. It, to me, it appears as if there is this little nidus of cartilage, and that's what it is, because it's cartilage broken off from the articular cartilage. And surrounding it are these little layers of bone formation and cartilage. And so this is a typical appearance of osteocartilaginous loose body, just a higher power appearance of it, showing these little nodules with uh, pink or most bone formation. So osteocartilaginous loose body is like this. Now in addition to that, in DGRT joint disease. This is something that we have to deal with and which is a very important thing. This patient obviously has a triacid. There is pigment in there and little nodules like this, maybe five in And there is villous hypertrophy of the joint. And one may mistake it for pigmented with an autosinovitis. But in these cases, the question is, is there infection or not. And the way, way to tell from pigmented with autosinovitis is the presence of these foreign material with foreign body reaction. If this were pigmented with autosinovitis, the whole area will be produced, the thickening will be produced by this proliferation of mononuclear cells, synovial cells. And one would not see this foreign material with foreign body reaction. Now this process can be extremely destructive. And here's another, here's an, an example of a heavy palpectomy, which was done for this post arthroplasty change. This entire material was composed of these histocytes, and it was so destructive that there was no way to treat it except with a heavy palpectomy. And you can see this is a section from within the bone, normal bone there, narrow fat, these histiocytes proliferating throughout the marrow space. And this is just the higher power appearance of these histiocytes. 
So degenerative joint disease is idiopathic most of the time. I think we get degenerative joint disease because we stand, if we were on our, our four feet, then we will not get degenerative joint disease. So it's the pressure from walking and standing that causes degenerative joint disease. But there are other conditions like hypospasia, left pathway for disease, fracture, infection, avascular process, degenerative disease, which can give rise to degenerative uh, joint disease. Now, we do not get to see femoral heads anymore, as I said. There are two reasons for doing that. One, the surgeons believe that we don't provide them any good information. And it's a waste of money to send this for about pathological examination. And the other reason is that they grind up these femoral heads and use them for uh, bone drum. Now, Dr. DiCarlo from uh, New York looked up <coughs> their experience with almost 2,000 cases of femoral head. And diagnosis of osteoarthritis is not very high at 5%. I don't think the surgeons would worry too much about that. But avascular necrosis was missed in some cases. Does that make a lot of difference? Probably not. But this is what they found. And there were examples of myeloma, lymphoma, even a sarcoma, which were missed because, which would have been missed if these femoral heads had not been examined pathologically. Now, some of the others, like an end chordroma, probably doesn't make a lot of difference. And both shares, I'm sure that surgeons know what both shares disease. That is probably not, often also is probably yes. <coughs> so now, I need to ask you a question. So, let's go back and look at the X-ray. So take a good look at the X-ray of the humerus. And now let's see what the answers are. A is rheumatoid arthritis, lupus arthritis. I had to think of a few things to say about arthritis. I don't know if it comes very many times back there. Pigmented melanolus in the synovitis, synovial chondromatosis, and changes which may be seen with tertiary cells. This is another example of what is called a neuropathic joint. People don't like to use the charcoal's uh, joint because that suggests that the patient has syphilis, and that's not always the case nowadays. Particularly. It's a neuropathic joint where the joint seems to have just disappeared. Very destructive joint disease. If you do an MRI, there will be a lot of swelling around the soft tissues, and you can see why there is swelling. Notice this patient has skin changes, probably associated with diabetes and peripheral neuropathy of diabetes. And here again, you can see if you look at the joint between the forefoot and the leg, there is a lot of loss of articular cartilage and form. And this is a pretty typical example of what you see in a neuropathic joint. It looks almost as if somebody has taken a knife and cut off the femoral head. And one, again, looks like almost a beak of a bird sitting there. Now, if you look at the histology of this, it's 
very disappointing. One would expect to see a lot of changes. But what you see are these lots of nodules of cartilage and bone and reactive newborn formation. And that is why there is swelling. This is pretty typical of hematopic ossification. But in this case, it was produced by neuropathic joint. Here's an example of a nodule on the Look at synovium of any kind and put it under water, you will see villas have a place here. So I photographed, uh, photographed this uh, synovium under water to look, make it look like villas proliferation. And this is pretty normal appearing synovium with a few giant cells and a few plasma cells. And that is all you usually see in uh, rheumatoid synovitis collection of plasma cells around vascular cells. <coughs> you may see necrosis, as you see, the granoid necrosis here, with surrounding histiocytes. And this is normal synovium in Japan's and rheumatoid synovitis. Rheumatoid synovitis sometimes is associated with rheumatoid nodule, as you know, and there is this nodule. And this is what it looks like grossly. These yellow areas are the areas of fibrinoid necrosis associated with rheumatoid nodule. And this is, this shows the uh, fibrinoid necrosis, little stellate up here, and benign giant cells and mononuclear cells. Now when you see a, a, a rheumatoid nodule or a necrobiotic granuloma, especially in children, and necrobiotic granulomas are pretty common in children, probably associated with diabetes. One of the differential diagnostic possibilities is epithelial sarcoma, because they also show necrosis of the center and proliferation of these mononuclear cells around the periphery. And the simplest way to tell the difference is that in rheumatoid synovitis, it is the necrosis is in the form of stellate areas of necrosis, whereas in epithelial sarcoma, they are well circumscribed little areas of necrosis and granuloma-like features of them. And this is just a higher power appearance of rheumatoid synovitis. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of synovial chronomatosis, pretty extreme examples. And this shows that synovial chronomatosis can involve bone, erode into bone. And there are multiple nodules of uh, cartilage, and they can be extreme examples, like you can see this huge area of synovial chronomatosis here again, and erosion into the underlying bone. Synovial chronomatosis can involve unusual locations, such as the spine. The temporomandibular joint is relatively commonly involved. And this is what synovial chronomatosis looks like. It looks like cartilage, the pale blue color of cartilage. And this is pretty typical, nodules embedded in the synovium. <coughs> as you see here. And here is like a gross example of permeation, or I should say permeation, erosion of the article, the cartilage of synovial chronomatosis into the joint, into the bone. Synovial chronomatosis is one of those conditions which can look malignant when in fact it is benign. Malignant because these chondrocytes look pretty hyperchromatic, cellular. But what important clue in telling us that this is benign is that these are in clusters. Quadrosacrobans do not grow like that. And if you take this out of context, let's say you get an eel biopsy from this, it would be very easy to fall into the trap of following this as a quadrosacroban. And you got more bizarre looking nuclei. And this is osteopathological school's body. We talked already about that, how it is different. Now, can synovial chronomatosis undergo malignant change? Yes, indeed. Practically anything that is benign can go undergo malignant change. But it's extremely uncommon. And this is one example of one in which there is huge tumor masses involving both sides of the joint. But in spite of this, the, the proof that this was malignant was that it metastasized to the lung. Otherwise, it would be pretty difficult to say. Now here's one example that we had at the Mayo Clinic, and here you can see this patient has had 
prior surgery with the popcorn in there. And all of this is mixed soil looking material, this cartilage. And whenever you see cartilage from anywhere, and it looks mixed soil, and if you touch it, it sticks to your finger, then it's bullet. And here, it, you can practically not even say that this is cartilage because it's so mixed soil. And here it is. Here is an ovary bonomatosis, typical <coughs> on the, the left side, and here's this mixed soil of the stroma right next to it. So here is the benign counterpart and the malignancy. <laughs> the other feature that I look for is loss of the clustering arrangement of the cells. Here the partner cells are arranged in sheets, and that also tells me that this is. Here is a typical example of <coughs> and here is constant loss of the arrangement. And it looks like this. It looks almost like a chondroblastic osteosarcoma. Then it has to be called synovial chondrosarcoma. And here again, sheets of cells, and that is molecular. Okay, well, I was going to say a few more words about malignant pigmented venomous but again, it's such a rare thing that I probably would not 